welcome to episode 26 of Divine Superconductor Radio. I'm your host, Matt Blackburn, and today we're speaking with Mr. Morley Robbins for the second time. In this episode, we focus a little more on iron, although Morley goes into copper and iron and brings up some really interesting ideas to ponder about those two really crucial minerals that have to be in balance and be found in the right places in the body. I got into magnesium probably about eight years ago, and it's always been a big foundational piece of my health. It's one of the main electrolyte salts that runs the entire body. And until I met Morley, I thought it was only 300 enzymes. Turns out it's 3,700 plus enzymes that are magnesium dependent. So that's a game changer right there. People with insomnia, magnesium deficient, brain fog, fatigue, depression, anxiety, slow recovery. I mean, it goes on and on, cardiovascular issues. So Morley goes into a lot of that in this talk and it's really fascinating. I think you guys are gonna love it. Enjoy. All right, Morley Robbins is back on the show. Welcome. Well, thanks. Looking forward to our continued uh, discussion today. Yeah, thanks so much. Uh, last, the last one really blew my mind. And before we started recording here, I was talking about how uh, I'm really interested in the connection between the liver and uh, and iron. And I never would have made that connection in the past. And it's, it's, it's like a repository. I think there are a lot of minerals in there. Uh, we, we know we've got magnesium. We know we've got copper. And all we're told is it's an iron organ. Well, it's it's a lot more complicated than that, as we well know. Yeah, definitely. And we could definitely touch on copper and iron and, and C and as those relate. But in this episode, I wanted to focus more on magnesium mm -hmm. and vitamin D because we didn't get to delve too deeply into those. And um, on YouTube, you have actually a lot of great interviews um, up there about magnesium. And there's even that that lecture what was it misled and misfed right. all about magnesium yep, absolutely that one's really good yeah and uh and we've got what four hours today to talk about this <laughs> <laughs> almost yeah, okay good that's about how much time we're going to need to really do it justice no this will be fun to focus on that that'd be great yeah and so in our first uh in our first talk, you mentioned that magnesium is responsible for the activation of 42% of enzymes in the body. Is that mm -hmm. correct? Yeah. So there's, um, you may have heard of the inflammasome. Uh, they, they, they characterize these um, pathways in the body that relate to different functions. Well, there's something called the magnosome, M-A-G-N-A-zome, magnosome. And it's it's the reach. I guess it's really what it is. It's a metabolic reach of a mineral or metabolic reach of a of a particular pathway. Well, the magnosome, I believe the number is three thousand seven hundred and fifty two proteins that connect and depend on magnesium. You know, but you have to be uh, mindful though that just about every cell. I think uh, the the most accepted number of cells in our body is. 100 trillion, it's a big number. Um, and then we think about the fact that there's what, nine bacteria for each human cell. It's like, you start to think, wow, how's this working? But um, 100 trillion cells and every one of them needs energy. Well, the energy molecule we know as ATP or it's called adenosine triphosphate. Well, it doesn't work if it doesn't have magnesium attached to it. So really, the reach of magnesium is it's systemic. It's the whole body. But there's a, a recognized uh, interface between magnesium and this 3,700 proteins. So a lot of the literature that you'll read will talk about magnesium influences or shapes 300 enzymes, and they'll be very proud of that big number. But that number, I, drag, I wanted to drag, really delve into that and find out what was the source. And the source was a uh, professor of medicine at Harvard Medical School, Burt Valley, loved magnesium. And he was asked once, he said, Dr. Valley, what's the reach of magnesium? And he just grabbed a number out of the sky and said, oh, I think it's about 300. 
And that has become the cornerstone of scientific literature as well as all, just about every internet article. And it's just, it's ludicrous when you think about how the body runs and how dependent we are on energy and the inside of the cell is not happy without magnesium. Awesome. Yeah, that was a great explanation. And it's as far as ATP production, I've been researching the importance of active thyroid hormone and 90% is converted in the liver of T4 to T3. Right. And our cells need T3 to make energy. But would you say magnesium and T3 are equal in terms of importance or is one more important? No one's ever asked me that. That's a great question. Um, <clears throat> that because I know there's there's different things needed to make energy, right? And I right. guess, but I think just people are prioritizing the wrong things. It's like they're trying right. to take herbs to boost their energy or something like that. Yeah. So <clears throat> when you get into the the mechanics and the physiology of the mitochondria, you have to you begin to study the movement of electrons and the whole process of reduction oxidation chemistry, which is that is the movement. That's the creation and movement of electrons. <clears throat> and there's there's many articles that I've read. They talk about um, T3 as the spark inside the mitochondria, and that's kind of, that's kind of the Disney version. So the the best version that I've seen, the one that again, my litmus test is does it really make sense metabolically? And I think there's way too much emphasis placed on thyroid function. I think that's a, a misnomer and a mythology. But um, what I, I found an article a couple months ago, it was probably about maybe six months ago, was fascinating because it was talking about T3 being a sensor for oxygen metabolism and fat metabolism. And when you understand what the mitochondria does, that's the essence of the mitochondria, is that it's it's metabolizing, it's converting the oxygen molecule that you know it's two two uh, atoms of of oxygen coming together to make the, the dioxygen molecule. And <clears throat> what the mitochondria does is in complex four that copper enzyme cytochrome C oxidase turns one molecule of oxygen into two molecules of water. That's a big deal. And in order to work with oxygen inside the mitochondria, you got to have bioavailable copper. And the, the other side of it is the mitochondria really loves fat. That's the preferred fuel for the mitochondria because you can make 140 uh, units of ATP out of one unit of fat. You can make 32 units of ATP out of one unit of sugar or glucose, and you can make two whopping ATP when you ferment sugar, right? So we know those are big numbers, but but the but that makes folks so much more sense. Why don't we use fat because it's so much more efficient to do it, but you're also going to consume more oxygen because you can't break down fat without oxygen, and those enzymes are called beta oxidation enzymes, right? Beta oxidation of fatty acids. That's that's the mechanism. And guess what mineral is essential for that? Copper, ding, ding, ding. And so what I was reading in this article, T3 is sensing how's the oxygen in, in here? And T3 is sensing how's the fat burning in here? And if it's not where it needs to be, it signals we need more ceruloplasmin which is the bioavailable form of copper so that oxygen can be played with and fat can be burned. And that makes more sense to me than this, this kind of pedestrian, well, the thyroid runs the body and it goes into the mitochondria and sparks it to do stuff. It's like, you know, when my kids were four years old, I think they would believe that. And it, it doesn't make sense when you really delve into the... Um, electromagnetism and the physics of the mitochondria. So I, I, the truth may be somewhere in between. Uh, is, is magnesium important in that process? We know it is. You can't, you can't move the electrons down the electron transport chain, but the whole process of what's called oxidative phosphorylation is dependent upon magnesium. And then the complex five 
is a rotor, as it's F1, FO rotor, and it's spinning at 9,000 revolutions per minute. The car you drive redlines at 6,000. And, and every 120 degrees of that rotor, it's making one more ATP. And so we're making 27,000 magnesium ATP every minute, right? That's pretty fast. And just to put it into context, because I know you like context, each time our heart beats, we need a billion ATP. And so we better have good sources of magnesium and copper in our heart in order to make sure that there's enough heart, there's enough ATP to make the heart beat. Right? And, then, and then you think about the fact that it's got to beat with a rhythm. That's incredible. I mean, when you start to step in, step into the the, uh, the majesty of the body, it's just absolutely mind bending. It is, yeah. And I think people neglect to remember that we need energy to, for everything, right? Absolutely. Not only for functioning, but but for healing. And so, absolutely, when people have, yeah. people have a heart issue. It's like there's not enough energy in the heart to to heal it and rebalance it, right? Yeah. And in fact, there's a famous uh, team of pathologists. One, uh, Baraldi and Silver. Beraldi was in Italy, Silver was in Canada. And uh, they, they wanted to, they, they did something that no one had ever done. They took cadavers of people who had had heart attacks and they wanted to do molds of the heart to find out where the block was. Because that's the whole basis of cardiology is that there's an ischemic block. There's a, there's a, a, a place where the blood can't get through. And that's what causes the, the heart to stop beating, and they couldn't find any blocks. And it's it's a it's a, a book that you can download. Uh, it's called the Etiopathology of Heart Disease. It's like 320 pages, and it's a fascinating read. And they basically blew up the the, the conventional model of cardiology with their research. It's very interesting, and it's all about energy. You're absolutely right. Uh, the, the probably the leading mind on this whole thing. Her name is Joanna. Ingwall, I-N-G-W-E-L-L. She's a PhD physiologist and she's at Harvard Medical School. And she wrote a book uh, on ATP in the heart. And it's it's a fascinating read. I, I spent, I'm embarrassed to tell you, but the book is 260 pages long. I've spent about that much money uh, on that book. And she talks about magnesium in three different places. It's like, huh? What are you talking about? <laughs> <laughs> that's super cool i'm definitely going to check that out and uh, one fascination with me is I, I don't know if i heard it from you or someone else but oxygen sinks like basically things that soak up oxygen mm -hmm. and lipofuscin and iron are like huge ones right but i'm sure there's others yeah an another one that's that's an important oxygen sink is cholesterol it takes 11 molecules of oxygen to make one molecule of cholesterol and and cholesterol goes all the way back to dirt when copper and oxygen, you know, first started forming on the planet some, what, two billion years ago or whatever the number is. It's a big, long time ago, but cholesterol is a, is a big oxygen sink. Lipofusin is, it's a scary uh, substance, as you well know, and it's, it's basically glycated sugars and fat that just um, hold, they hold a lot of iron too. It, it, it's just, it's like, that substance that I don't know, it's like, ooh, it's, it's, and it's, it's attached to a lot of different conditions, as you know, but uh, I don't, I don't, I've never seen a picture of it. I don't know what its composition is, but I think it'll be a scary moment when I do. <laughs> Definitely. Yeah. And the reason why I brought up the oxygen sink is because oxygen is the terminal electron acceptor that mm -hmm. pulls them all across. Right? right. And so it's maybe a combination of like adding magnesium to the system and then maybe dealing with the iron issue yeah. and other things. Oh, yeah. I, what I, I'll tell you, if, if you're into cardiology at all, uh, which is it's a fascinating area, I, I've studied it pretty carefully because I take you after a, a branch of the family where everyone died of heart attacks. So my mom, my mom died of her third, her mom died of her third, her dad died of his second, and his dad died of his first. So I'm like, that's the Matthews family. That's my middle name. So I, I figure I'm next, right? So I want to I wanna know how am I going to go down? But um, it, it's a fascinating field because it, it really does depend on energy, as you know. And that's not what the, the world of cardiology is about. And uh, the best book that I've ever read on this subject 
is by um, Stephen Sinatra. He's a Connecticut-based cardiologist, as you know, and he wrote a book called Metabolic Cardiology, wonderful paperback that he wrote basically for his cardiac patients because he was tired of being awakened at two o'clock to have to go to the hospital. And there's a whole chapter in there on magnesium and how important it is. And and he really explains your, what you just alluded to about oxygen. He refers to oxygen as a metabolic garbage can, which I think is kind of harsh. Um, but that's that. It really drives home the point about how important that oxygen is for as a uh, electron receptor, and and then it turns into water, which is pretty darn important. Um, but it's a it's a wonderful book that really explains the physiology of the heart. And as as much as I enjoy it, and he's got that chapter on card on, on magnesium. I found 140 places in the book where he could have talked about magnesium more. But um, but the th one caution I have with your listeners is don't pick up his book um, about inflammation and heart disease because that, that was not written with the same degree of uh, research or integrity, I don't think. Interesting. Yeah, I've been obsessed with uh, like systemic enzymes and researching fibrin and fibrinogen. Oh, yeah. How that yeah. Kind of shrinks the organs <laughs> over time. Yeah, no, it does. That's fascinating to me. Yeah, yeah. It's a, th that's a very powerful protein, as you know. And it, and it doesn't play nice with iron either. <laughs> yeah it, iron's the catalyst for everything yeah <laughs> it, well in the right in the right context yeah that's exactly right yeah, yeah i'm very true yeah um have you heard of dr thomas uh cowan mm -hmm. because i i use oh, yeah. his vegetable powders oh yeah I, I think he wrote a book like the heart is not a pump and um the reason we're talking about the heart so much is for the listeners is because that's if you don't have magnesium there right right and you're so tense that's the first thing to go right <laughs> yeah and, and, and the part that it's important to understand that the um, as I as I got into studying magnesium, I was trying to get into the psychology of these minerals, you know, and and it it's it's the magnesium is the mineral of motion. It's the mineral of recovery. It's the mineral of relaxation. You know, all these people that want to do meditation to relax, I go, well, why don't you go take some magnesium and then you can meditate? Because if you try to meditate when you're all amped up because of all your stress. How, how would you ever get into a mindless state? It's just, it's not going to happen. And the the thing is that the magnesium, uh, it's it's essential. There, there's a wonderful, it's like a two minute video, YouTube video by, um, um, I'm blanking on her name right now. I'll, I'll think of her name, but it's a, a very, it's, a, it's an outstanding um, video about how the cell works with magnesium. And I'm so embarrassed I can't think of her name right now. She wrote a book with Mildred Seelig, and, or Andrea Rosanoff. Thank you. Andrea Rosanoff is a PhD um, nutritionist, and she really loves magnesium. She has this two-minute video on how the, how, the mus how the muscle cells work. And it's what happens is magnesium invites the calcium to come into the cell. The ca calcium causes the contraction, right? And then magnesium says, now get out of here. And that, magnesium is regulating the whole process. And it's beautifully depicted in that, in that cell, in that video. And that's the way the heart works. The heart, it, it does need calcium. We know that. It needs all those, a lot of minerals. But magnesium is regulating the ebb and flow of these minerals. And there's no more important place to do it than the heart. There's a, a series of cells in the center of the heart called the pacemaker cells, right? You know, and they're doing just what you think they would be doing. They're the, they're the drumbeat of the heart and they function on an enzyme called MKK4 and it's magnesium dependent. So the drumbeat of the heart requires magnesium. Well, energy of the heart requires magnesium. The regulation of the heart requires magnesium. And, and when we're under stress, what's the first mineral to leave the body? Magnesium, and it, it, and if and if you carry your energy in your heart, that's when people have problems with their heart because they don't have enough magnesium there. Wow, that's fascinating. And now we have non-native EMFs, which have been shown in research to really disrupt our electrical activity. And um, you, 
you made me think of the voltage gated ion channels. Absolutely. And that's yeah. the biggest effect of non-native EMF is it calcium floods in, right? Which is a hallmark of stress. And so I think I've heard Mercola talk about, oh, magnesium blocks that. And mm-hmm. yeah. Um, so again, things, yeah. EMFs is a stressor. It's a physical environmental stressor. The way the body's wired is in the face of stress, magnesium gets released. And so then calcium comes into that um, gated calcium channel, the L, L-type and T-type, both, both types. And, and people probably have heard of calcium channel blockers, right? And they think that those medications are blocking calcium, right? Because it's called a calcium channel blocker, right? Well, what's the metal that it's actually blocking? It's blocking iron. Iron is coming in those calcium channels. And that's why iron is so destructive to physiology. And the guy that did the most work that I know of on that is um, Jer- Jerry Sullivan. Uh, he's since passed away, but he developed the iron heart hypothesis. And for people who really want to get a more updated version of this, there's a uh, physician named James D. DeMonico, and he wrote a recent article about the heart and copper and magnesium, and it's 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 brand new. It's like I think it's a 2019 article, James D. DeMonico, and it's really wonderful. Very very well written article. Awesome. Yeah, yeah. I love all you. You always send me articles, and I love every everyone's a rabbit hole. Yeah, it's that's really right. fun. Yeah, yeah. Oh, well, I'm trying to keep you off the street. That's what I'm trying to do. <laughs> um, quick aside question. This is just fascinating to me. Um, I know trace minerals are also very important for the body and just weird ones like vanadium and stuff. And I've heard a theory, I've never seen evidence that like gold is concentrated in the heart and that's where like the heart of gold oh. comes from. Have you ever heard of that or looked into that? No, I, I mean, I've, I've certainly heard the expression and I certainly know that, again, what, what metal conducts electricity the best? It's actually gold. You know, we use, we use uh, copper because it's plentiful and it's good. Silver is that much better. Platinum is probably even faster, but gold apparently is the, that's the preferred uh, medium for electrons. I'm not not exactly sure why, but obviously they flow through there pretty fast. But that's fascinating. I've never heard that about gold being a um, a depot in the heart. That's fascinating. I have to look into that. Yeah, I'm sure it's like 0. 0.00 something percent, yeah. you know, but still. <laughs> but, it, but it just takes a whisper, right? right. Yeah, well, that's, that's actually pretty cool. A heart of gold. That's that's so cool. I've never never <laughs> thought of it that way. Literally, that's pretty pretty interesting. Um, and then I I really wanted to talk about brain function magnesium because that's my passion. I used to be in education, the juvenile uh, kids, and just seeing a lot of ADD and just mm-hmm. like aggressive behavior. And I personally struggled with anxiety for years, and I see people depressed. I mean, how it's hard not to be looking <laughs> looking at our world. Right. But Absolutely. just all of these emotional mental things and even like mental retardation, right? Like the brains, you're not playing with the full deck when you're magnesium deficient, right? <laughs> no. And I, and I think what we have to do is we have to keep reminding ourselves that we need energy to make things work. Just like you said, you got to have energy regardless of what we're doing, whether it's thinking or digesting food or think a, a detox or whatever it might be. But um the, the brain, obviously a very uh, sensitive organ. Uh, the, 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 the frontal brain is big into executive function and having control over our thoughts and activities. I don't, I don't know the, all the different components of the brain, but it's, I do know that the executive function is very dependent on magnesium. A memory, which is typically stored in the hippocampus, absolutely dependent on magnesium. And, and it's actually, so the, the little file drawers in the hippocampus where the memory gets stored and what opens up the file drawer is magnesium. Pretty, pretty cool. But um, the, the, some fascinating things about the brain to get a sense of the environment of it. Uh, there's 10 times more cholesterol in the brain than there is in the body. That's a pretty powerful thought. Uh, and then when we come to realize that 99% of that cholesterol is recycled, it doesn't come from our diet. So we need to get that download when we're developing as a fetus and as a baby. 
And we get the download uh, for a lot of those nutrients through breast milk. And, and I wasn't breastfed. I don't know about you, but those who do get breastfed are very lucky because they get full complement, hopefully. But, um, but the cholesterol is really important for a lot of different reasons, not the least of which is 70% of the cholesterol in the brain is being used to make myelin sheath, which is a copper-dependent function, uh, but made by one of my favorite cells, the oligodendrocytes. Like, where do they come up with these names? I mean, they're just insane. But, but it's a very important part of the brain tissue. So basically, you have neurons and glial cells. And within the glial, the neurons we know about, those are the nerve endings, right? Well, the glial cells have different functions. There's the ones that make the, the myelin sheath. There's one, there are macrophages called microglial cells. The, the astrocytes, it's another form of glial cell. Well, the astrocyte is this ridiculously important cell. It's doing all the work and the neurons getting all the credit. And obviously the magnesium status is very important. The, the other part that's important is people have seen the classic picture of the, the synapse between the, the neuron and, the, and the, the gap between the, the two neurons. Well, that synapse is, is regulated by copper, and it's regulating the, the movement and the, and the uh, activity of glutamate and GABA. Can't, can't do that without, without copper. But um, another important aspect of, of neural functioning is that to anyone who's ever had a um, brain, brain trauma, any kind of like a, a concussion or they've been in a car accident or whatever, there's, there's a massive loss of magnesium, again, because that's the first mineral to go with stress. And it, that's not understood. That I don't think neurologists really have a command of minerals to know that when there is this kind of physical blunt trauma, we need to do whatever we can to restore that mineral balance. Because when, when magnesium leaves the, the scene, it begins to invite all sorts of, of imbalance and, and enzymes aren't working right, energy is not being made properly, and you can begin to kind of extrapolate on that. But the, the role of magnesium is multifaceted. Uh, it also protects the, um, the blood-brain barrier. Uh, again, that's a, there's an energetic field there. And the more magnesium you have there, the more protected you are. And so if you don't have magnesium there, then things like monosodium glutamate begin to wreak havoc on your body. And so it's, it, it's the thing is that the, the beauty of magnesium is it just addresses so many different symptoms, but it doesn't correct the underlying physiology. That To do that, you really got to, address the uh, the dynamics between copper and iron. That was awesome. And there's three things I want to expand on, sure. two of them related to magnesium. Yeah, that's all right. Go ahead. <laughs> but the first one related to iron is you mentioned microglial cells um, being macrophages. So I would imagine if they're loaded with iron, which is where <laughs> where iron goes, then that's going to screw with your, your brain function, right? That absolutely does. And so that then becomes <clears throat> the mechanism for different conditions like Alzheimer's, Lou Gehrig's, Huntington's disease, Parkinson's. Um, there's a whole series of proteins that influence brain function. Uh, you've heard of amyloid precursor protein, APP, um, beta amyloid protein, um, alpha synuclein, uh, tau protein, prion protein. These are all very important proteins that have regulatory roles, but if they get filled with iron, guess what happens? They start to accumulate. They start to aggregate, and they get sticky. Well, there's nothing good about sticky in the brain, because you want it again mineral of motion. You want a lot of back and forth, and those uh, those um, neural proteins are attached to all the diseases of the of neurodegeneration, and it all originates with uh, the lack of copper being bioavailable causing the dysregulation of iron, which causes the aggregation of these proteins, which then forms these symptoms that might express as Alzheimer's around memory and uh, the dementia or motion disorder that might be either Huntington's or Parkinson's and, and so on down the line. So it's, it's all 
the same root problem. It's just expressing in different tissue because of where energy is held and just the dynamics of how the brain works. Wow. Oh, that's awesome. And that's why you have the root cause protocols. <laughs> oh, yeah, right. Exactly. Um, um, th- another big point you made, you made that I really want to expand on is um, if you're in an accident, there's a massive loss of magnesium. And I think this is the context that a lot of people are missing, that when they go through an extreme st- stressful event, even if it's moving or a breakup, that's right. or they lost their job, um, even their B vitamins, I, I think I've read, increases their requirements for short time, like maybe massive amounts of B vitamins, I, but I get, magnesium is the same. Yeah, it's a, the thing is, the, the magnesium and the B vitamins get lost in water. They go to our urine. And we, we pee them out. So there's a, a massive loss of these nutrients that are so important. And <clears throat> what happens is whenever there's an injury to the body, physical injury, the body recruits hemoglobin. Why does it recruit hemoglobin? Because it needs oxygen. Why does it need oxygen? We were just talking about the garbage can, right? So the mitochondria need that oxygen in order to make energy. And if you don't have bioavailable copper, and you don't have magnesium, no can do. You can't make energy. And so then when that happens, the oxygen hangs out with that iron and it creates rust. And for anyone who's had a head injury, traumatic brain injury, they probably have had an MRI and they can ask their doctor to show them the hemosiderin stain. And hemosiderin is where iron goes to die in tissue, especially in that macrophage tissue. And it gets stuck in that lipofusion that you were talking about, which is a scary tissue. But um, that stain is an indication that iron's not being properly regulated and that there's magnesium and copper missing in that brain. And that's a, that's a very serious situation. I was reading a book this morning, which unfortunately I didn't have a magnesium foot bath nearby and my toes were curling, but it was a, it's a book. Uh, written, it's published by the National Academy Press, which is attached to the National Academy of Sciences. And the title of the book is Copper in Drinking Water. You can you can download it for free. And I would encourage your listeners to do that. And then read chapter three on the diseases of copper deficiency. Now, Matt, I've read a lot of articles about copper. I was learning stuff today that I've never seen before. And it was it was an oh my god moment because the the development of the fetus is really dependent upon copper, and and if it doesn't have that copper, these are the areas that are affected the most: the brain, the heart, the lungs, the liver, the kidney. But other than that, nothing to worry about, right? And and again, most people don't even know what a mineral is. You're, you're very unique in that you're fascinated by them and that your followers are excited about them. But, but these are the spark plugs that make enzymes work. And there's you know, thousands of enzymes that we depend on every day. And we, our ancestors used to get their minerals from their food and their water. No can do anymore. We have to be more creative. So that that when people are in brain injury, they need minerals, not medications. That's that's the bottom line. I love it. That's so true. It's it's really cool where I live. I'm actually on a well mm. uh, down the street. That's where all the water coming out of my faucets and stuff. And I still want to filter it because of the iron, because mm-hmm. acid rain will absolutely. get iron into that well. Absolutely. But, You're absolutely. but I saw a report. It was actually, there's a good amount of copper in the water. I'm like, this is kind of cool. Maybe I'm getting it transdermally when I'm washing my hands. Or, yeah. No, or, that, that that's important to know that. And most people don't even, you know, they've never done a, a mineral analysis of their water. But when we moved to Louisiana, I got, um, I could feel my blood pressure was rising. I don't, I mean, I grew up in a family that had high blood pressure. I didn't have it, but I knew what the symptoms were and went from being a city slicker to being on a farm and well water. And within a week I was having headaches and that was never my pattern. And we, we ordered the um, analysis of the water. It's like, oh my gosh. And so we filtered the water and it, it, everything calmed down, but it's like, People don't know about this. They don't know the. Was it high in iron? High in iron, or... absolutely high in iron. And it was yeah. just, it was knocking me for a loop. So, 
That's wild. Yeah. I'm a big fan of water filtration and there's a big push for like spring water. And I, I just think it makes sense to filter our water. I mean, there's a smoke ring around the entire planet. It's like, we're not living, we're not in Kansas anymore. We really aren't. That's so. right. That's very <laughs> true. Absolutely true. <laughs> Smoke ring around the plant. That's got kind of like that. <laughs> um, burning fossil fuels, you know, just sulfuric and nitric. And oh, yeah, that. absolutely. Um, but one big thing I want to talk about, and this is on the topic of, of stress. Um, and this is something I actually just recently learned, I think a few days ago, that uh, magnesium is recycled. You were talking about cholesterol being recycled in the brain. But magnesium is too, but it's recycled less when we're chronically stressed. Is that correct? Like we lose more of it when we're stressed, but when we're in a balanced state, then our body will actually reuse. I can't remember like forty percent of it or something. Yeah, I'm not sure what the exact number is. Um, the the person who probably is the most lucid about magnesium, again, Andrew Rosenoff is a great resource, but Mildred Seelig is your go-to. Um, after that, uh, it would be Burton and Bella Altura. They're a PhD. Uh, physiologists up at uh, SUNY Downstate Medical Center. Uh, they are, if between together, they've published over a thousand articles on magnesium. Uh, and again, for people who are really into this magnesium thing, go to mgwater.com and you can download Mildred Seelig's textbook. You can download hundreds and hundreds of articles by the Alturas and other people. Um, so it's just they're wonderful sources of information and absolutely the body uh, does hold on to these minerals when it's not a stress cadet but i think it's you know i've heard the the comment that we have more stress in one day of our life than our great grandparents had in their entire lifetime there's i don't know if there's any way to quantify that and really validate whether that's true or not there are some days when i feel like that you know you know when you're when you're thinking about the fact that you had to write a letter and you wouldn't hear a response back for probably a week or two or maybe three, you know you didn't have this instantaneous, you know, you know I'm going to get back at you and I, you know you you weren't flying on planes and you weren't thinking about all of the insanity in our food system and our whatever systems, and it's a very different world now. So I think the challenge is to find peace amidst a very stressful world. And I think it's easier to find that peace when you're well hydrated with magnesium, as I call it. When Once the magnesium burn rate goes up, once your stress is, is rising, it's very hard to be at peace. Very, very hard. Yeah, that's well said. I, I think of people, a lot of people that follow me are in apartments in I just think of that as human factory farms, you know, yeah. it's so it's too crammed together and there's just way more toxicity. I think the VOCs, every time I would go to a friend's house that lived in like a complex, usually see the cancer warning sign, you know, this place has lead just, just so you know, you know, yeah, exactly. yeah. <laughs> and EMFs, all these things. EMFs, so, smart meters, uh, all sorts of modems. Again, you probably have seen the, the articles or the videos about the classrooms where they put plants next to the modem and plants away from the modems and the ones around the modems die. They don't, they don't flourish. And that's a scary thought. And we all have them in our homes and in our workplaces. And we're surrounded by these cell towers. And now people are starting to freak out about 5G. And it's like, I don't even know how to process that. It's like, it's, it's bad enough with 4G. I, I don't know what's going to happen with 5G. It's, it's sort of a, it's almost fear porn, but I know it's, I know it's real. I mean, it's going to be a factor that we have to deal with and, and the EMFs that it's going to put out. For someone who's low in magnesium, low in bioavailable copper, and high in iron, they're going to be a, um, they're going to be an antenna for the 5G. I'm just like, that's sad, but that's exactly what's going to happen. Yeah, and, and just, um, I think we might have mentioned it in the last talk, but to support the adrenals, as well as having magnesium, whole food vitamin C and sodium are really important, right, for lowering stress. Minerals in general, but absolutely the, the, the function of the adrenals, and this is the, the pioneering work of Paul Eck and Dave Watts. They're the guys that basically developed hair tissue mineral analysis and then broke it down into specific um, ratios for different aspects of the body. But the adrenal ratio, it's the balance of sodium 
to magnesium. And in a hair test, what you're looking for is you're, you're looking for four parts sodium to one part magnesium. And that's, a, that's considered a really good ratio. Well, I bet less than 10% of my clients are even close to that. They're either way below it, so they've got this massive loss of, of sodium, <clears throat> coupled with a, a rise of magnesium, which is indi indicative of a loss, or they're at the other extreme where their, their adrenals are so amped up, have so, sodium coming out the yin-yang, and they don't have enough magnesium to keep up with it. And so those are, are, those are the bookends of adrenal dysfunction. And it, but the beauty of the hair test is it's a very powerful tool to measure, is this person under stress? And is this person able to make energy in the face of that stress? That's really the power of the, of the hair test. You don't, you don't diagnose appendicitis with a hair test. You know, people take that test to an extreme, which is it's not really designed for. I really focus on are the, are the macro ratios where they need to be, and if they're not, then I know the person's under stress. Very, very important to understand that. And the other thing that awesome. the other thing the, the uh, adrenals need. You talked, you mentioned uh, Tom Cowan. One of my favorite uh, lines of his is he calls it fat deficiency syndrome, right? And and we know that the adrenals love fat, but what they really love is retinol. They they because that retinol and that A get together and they just do amazing things inside the body. So the 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 nutrients that are really important. You mentioned minerals in general, but sodium and magnesium. We need the whole food vitamin C. We need fat. And then we need the most important nutrient of all, vitamin Z, sleep. And people don't like that at all. They like, they like trying to burn the candle at both ends. And, and when my adrenals burned out many years ago, I was, I was living on four to five hours sleep a night. And, and my adrenals did not really come back until I started getting eight, nine, and 10 hours of sleep. And when I did that, they perked right up. It was amazing. You need that parasympathetic uh, experience to nourish the adrenals. It isn't just about the nutrients. It's about the state of the nervous system to allow rest and recovery. Really, really important. Well said. And, and insomnia is kind of like a classic case of magnesium deficiency, right? Well, sure. You need magnesium for proper sleep. Well, yeah. And the, th the thing is, um, I was listening to a, a video by um, Joe Dispenza. If you don't know him, this guy's an amazing mind. He's a neurobiologist who became a chiropractor. And he has brilliant explanations for what's going on in our mind and our body and thoughts and emotions and stuff. But he was referring to uh, the the um, the neurotransmitter of daytime is called serotonin, and the neurotransmitter of nighttime is melatonin. Well, to get from serotonin to melatonin, you got to take two methyl groups off, right? That's really important. And I'm guessing that there's some methyltransferase enzyme involved in that. Well, that whenever you talk about methyltransferase enzymes, we're going to talk about minerals again. Copper is really important, and and if there's too much iron, you can't you can't do that. And if there's too much iron, guess who's missing? Maggie. Magnesium gets gets hosed. And so again, this, there's this very delicate balance between these minerals. And if and if the the gut and the mind can't make these neurotransmitters, then we're just miserable. And the the um, there's actually um, genes in our hypothalamus. Maybe you know this, but just for, for your listeners' sake, they're called clock genes. Are you familiar with them in the hypothalamus? The SDN, right? In the SDN. The suprachiasmatic nucleus. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> and those clock genes love magnesium. And in fact, as I understand it, uh, we don't really have a 24-hour clock in the human body. I believe it's either 23 hours and 50 minutes or it's 24 hours and 10 minutes. I think it might be the 23.50. So, so what met, one of the jobs of melatonin is to reset the clock every night. So we think it's 24 hours. And, and that's what happens is when people don't have that deep, restorative, melatonin-rich sleep, you don't change the clock, and then your clock starts to shift, and then suddenly people find they can't sleep at night. They can only sleep during the day. And their clock has become so, so uh, dysfunctional 
that they're off by 12 hours. Wow. Yeah, I, I use oil lamps at night and just Himalayan, really deep, uh, uh, damp, you know, lighting, very light. And Beautiful. I wear blue blockers yeah. if I'm looking at a screen. Yeah. I think that's super important. Absolutely. I mean, in fact, we should both have them on right now, looking at our, TV, <laughs> our computer screens. But uh, yeah, you're absolutely right about that. We have enough magnesium maybe to handle it. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, and, and the eye function, the, the, the minerals that are absolutely dominant in the eye, magnesium is huge, copper is huge, iron is huge. Where does, where is, what's one of the first places for iron accumulation in the body? It's the eye. Yeah. So all these eye conditions like uh, age-related macular degeneration, cataracts, glaucoma, all these conditions that people are worried about, it's iron. What does iron do? It hoses magnesium and disrupts copper. And the eye can't make energy. The eye can't make ceruloplasmin. And it's a critical part of its physiology is to, where, where's the most oxidative stress in the human body? It's in our eyes. It's exposed to light all the time. And people don't think about that from a physiological standpoint. But if you can't neutralize that oxidative stress, it's going to burn up the uh, function of the eye. Wow, that makes total sense. And heavy metals is something I really wanted to talk about because I think people are going, I get questions all the time, Matt, what do you think about IV chelation? And people do these crazy cleanses, but magnesium is like the natural way to actually get rid of heavy metals, right? Well, a, a healthy liver is a good way to get rid of metals, absolutely. And and if there's aluminum in the mix, magnesium is really powerful to, to clear that out. And um, very, very, very important. Um, mercury, uh, it's affecting uh, copper receptors, as you probably know. Uh, and again, there's this, this ma amazing affinity that takes place. You know, cadmium has a relationship to, to zinc. Um, lead has a relationship to calcium. So we need to know that there are mineral relationships to these heavy metals, but the, a lot of the, um, there's a lot of psychodrama about heavy metals. And I'm not, I'm not being a Luddite. I know how toxic they can be. You know, um, mercury, it's a, it's a heavy weight. It's huge in its, in its size, but <clears throat> we've been on this planet a long time and these metals, they're not new to the planet. Our, our ancestors, our ancient ancestors, had to be able to clear them. And, and of course, the levels are different. We know that. But let's, let's stay with mercury for a minute. When did mercury... Mercury has been used in the mouth, in, in uh, dentistry, since the Civil War. Okay, so that's a long time. But when did mercury become an issue? It was around in the 1970s. So 100 years after they started using it, it became a problem. What caused that? Well, there's some speculation that they changed the composition of the uh, quicksilver, you know, that they, they changed the mineral composition that got more copper in there or something. I, I've never seen any article that described it. But what they also did was they introduced high fructose corn syrup. What does high fructose corn syrup do? It's, it blocks the absorption of copper in the cell. And, and why is copper important? It's really important for enzymes in the liver to get rid of mercury. There's, there are enzymes that do that. And so and people jump into the heavy metal detox and EDTA and the others. Well, those, those chelators are bulldozers. Do you think they can distinguish between rose bushes and boulders? No, they take they get rid of all the metals and all the minerals, excuse me. And so I think what's important, if, if one of the outgrowths of these conversations is that people understand that iron is a heavy metal and it's in concentrations that are far higher than mercury or aluminum, they need to know that. The other thing that's important to understand is that, like with aluminum, it's a trivalent element. And I just read an article uh, last week talking about how trivalent metals, like aluminum, disrupt the conformational structure of ceruloplasmin, then it can't work. It can't do its enzyme functions, and copper starts to leak out. And so there are other trivalent metals besides aluminum, 
but that's a big one. It's in um, chemtrails. It's in vaccines. It's in, I don't know where else, it's, but it's pervasive on our planet right now. It's, I mean, it's, it's pervasive on the planet because it's right there on the surface, but, it, but they're using it in, in uh, very uh, disruptive ways, and it's, it's having an effect on our physiology. Yeah, I just found a study, my friend sent it to me, that orthosilicic acid, like that form of silica specifically, is 10 milligrams a day. Uh, in one month, 60 to 70% of aluminum leaves the body because it complexes mm -hmm. it uh, Absolutely. And, and makes a compound that can, can escape. So yeah. I do that in liquid form. And no, I think that's great. Good. That's a very smart thing to do. And I think that I've heard that even, even drinking Fiji water, which has a lot of silica in it, can be very effective. Or... People who are into herbs can drink um, horsetail tea, you know, a lot of very high composition of silica. And I think there's something about the horsetail, the form of the horsetail silica that's supposedly uh, very beneficial. I don't, I don't know. Yeah, I have friends that harvest that in the wild. It's kind of cool. That's, that's, that's very exciting. <laughs> um, I wanted to ask you, uh, before we jump into the Q&A, about coffee. I know you're a big fan. You you well, I enjoy, I enjoy, your articles are, I, I enjoy my coffee as I'm reading my articles. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> but it has a lot of benefits. I, I just keep reading in relationship, especially to heavy metals um, and, and iron absorption. It actually inhibits iron absorption. But um, there's research showing that a, a drip coffee will actually, uh, the grounds will actually bind to heavy metals well, like lead. That's so cool. And it won't end up in, in the end product. Yeah. No, I th that's, that's very exciting to hear. I, I think what we have to be careful of, though, is you know, we live in an era where, where you and I will say coffee and we're thinking, you know, dark roast and mod modest intervention with other things. And people down the street might be thinking, oh, my, you know, super duper latte with all sorts of sugars and that's not coffee. And so our, our great grandparents, they drank coffee. I'm not sure Starbucks is serving coffee. We have to be very careful about that, you know. Well said. Yeah. yeah, definitely. And and I think it's important to have the blood sugar regulated and have a low stress level because I think caffeine can exacerbate that, but mm -hmm. caffeine can have a benefit, I think, if yeah. if you're balanced and you have sufficient magnesium, especially. From from time to time, uh, when it, I go regularly to donate blood, uh, try to do it at least once a quarter. And um, sometimes I'll forget that that I'm going to, to donate blood and I'll have a you know a nice blast of coffee well it, it will send your blood pressure a little elevated sometimes especially if i'm if i'm really excited about some research that i'm doing and i'll go in and, and the you know the woman said you had coffee today didn't you i said yeah i did and they'll you know they'll, they'll let it pass they're not they're not too worried about it but it's it's funny yeah. it does have an effect and it does amp you up um i i've got a i've got a buddy in uh, uh florida and he he says that and again, there's all sorts of articles, pro and con, as you well know. But he's convinced that it, it can affect your copper status. And he has to be very careful. He's a People may know about the difference between fast and slow oxidizers. Well, the fast oxidizers really need their copper. And he's convinced that if he has too much cof cof he, yeah, co coffee, it affects his copper. And so he has to be very careful about that from time to time. I just throw that in for the for the those who are really delving into the uh, fascinating parts of this. That's really interesting. Yeah, this morning uh, before we I jumped on the show, I had hash browns and grass fed beef for breakfast, and then I had coffee with it to inhibit the iron, and then I take my beef liver usually with the coffee. So I kind of use it as a strategy to like reduce my iron absorption. You know, when I'm consuming things that's, with it. That's beautiful. No, that's great. It's good. It's good strategy. <laughs> Where do you get the? I'm yeah. curious. Where do you get the beef liver? I'm using ancestral supplements, and uh, I found a a good farm actually to get beef liver, but they're out of it. So I was, yep. I was really bummed because I, I I'm having trouble finding uh, beef liver, which is why the desiccated capsules are good. It's hard to source it. Uh, it's worth it once you find it. We have a a farmer locally that um, we, we get uh, half cows, quarter cows, whatever, and he's always happy to sell us the, the liver, but. Um, it's not easy to come by. That's the that's the challenge. Yeah, definitely. Um, so this is actually a good segue. Um, my friend Beverly asked about coffee enemas, and I think you mm -hmm. mentioned once that it affects copper. Um, 
she has said, is it just coffee enemas or is it all enemas? And I used to do them. I stopped all enemas. I don't do them at all anymore because I think they can do more damage than good. But I've, I haven't looked into how it affects uh, minerals much. Um, well, I think it's, I think it's a, a very useful technique under the right conditions. Um, the two most striking experiences with magnesium that I'm aware of is a, there's a, um, a doctor in North Carolina. He's known as Dr. Magnesium. And he was giving himself a shot of magnesium and overdid it and he passed out. And it was by the grace of God that his partner happened by, saw him passed out, knew what he probably did and gave him some calcium to bring him back because it will slow down your heart uh, if you take too much under under those conditions. So this is We're talking about very extreme situations. So a big bolus of magnesium, will it will have an effect on your heart. Um, but the other uh, situation was a, a husband and wife gave their nine-year-old son a magnesium enema and he died because uh, the colon will absorb minerals, especially magnesium, very, very effectively. And it overwhelmed his physiology. So again, like we started this conversation, context is king, right? You have to understand what are we, what are we trying to do? So there's a lot of uh, confusion about copper and iron. We know that. The, the, the party line, the propaganda is you're anemic and you're copper toxic. You need more iron and we got to get rid of that copper. Well, let's, let's do a coffee enema to get rid of that unbound copper. Well, the other thing that, that your friend Beverly found out by talking to uh, Dr. Uh, Lauren Pickert is that there is no unbound copper in the body. It's bound to something. That's important to know. And I'm really glad he shared that with her, which is very heretical for the internet crowd who thinks there's all sorts of booga booga copper running rampant in their body. It's bound to something. It may not be bound to ceruloplasm. It's going to be bound to either albumin or transcuprin, but it's bound to something. And there's a lot of folks who think that they can't live without that coffee enema because it helps to move their bowels. And they find great relief. And I, I get all that. I, I really do. Um, the, the thing is, let's talk about the physiology of the body and how does it really work. And, you know, we we're talking about coffee. One of the benefits of coffee is it will help to methylate. Why is methylation important? Because it helps to move the waste matter. That, that process of, of bile, bile function loves methylation. And, and coffee is delivering methyl groups like no other. And that's why people do it, you know, up their dairy air. But I don't think that's a natural way to do it. And I know I've talked to many clients who found relief from it, but it's symptomatic relief. It's not physiological correction. And I think we have to start separating those two. The fact that you don't get a headache doesn't mean that you've corrected the cause of the headache. You know, the fact that you stop the headache, that's not, that's not the solution. So I, coffee enemas, I think, have a very good rap that people love them, but I don't think they're understood in terms of what they do to, to disrupt the natural physiology and mineral balance of the liver because it, it will affect that. Awesome. Yeah, that was a great explanation. And I fully agree. I think it, in context, it can relieve, you know, maybe in an emergency situation, it's good, maybe food poisoning or something, but not as a daily kind of thing. Um, what about menstrual headaches, neck aches that started during pregnancy with third child? Someone's asking. He thinks it might be magnesium deficiency. Well, magnesium is certainly a part of the equation. So, so what's helpful for you, uh, folks to understand is that the um, back to Mildred Seelig, the magnesium expert, uh, she was also a mother, so she understood what pregnancy was about, and she referred to pregnancy as a magnesium deficient state. There's a constant loss of magnesium because there's a constant source of stress. You're growing a new infant and it's changing the physiology, not just of the infant, but of the mother. So there's a lot of stress involved. And a very important uh, mineral transaction takes place in the last trimester of the pregnancy. And so you and I have livers that have about seven milligrams of copper, and that's a good amount. Um, 
we half of our copper is in our bone marrow, just for those who are curious. And that's about 45 milligrams of iron. So seven milligrams of copper in the liver is, it's a lot, but it's not bigger than the bone, obviously. And when we were born as infants, we had 70 milligrams of copper in our liver. Okay, That's 10 times more copper in our liver when we were born. And where did we get all that copper? It was from the ceruloplasmin from our mom. And the baby, the infant, has a preferential uptake of copper from the mother's ceruloplasmin. And this is not just humans. This is all mammals. And this is all mammals, third trimester do this copper download, can't live without it. And and then we get retinol through breast milk. And the retinol helps to load the copper into the ceruloplasm protein. And for the first two years of life, the infant doesn't really have an immune system. And they're dependent on that copper and that retinol to start to piece together their immune system. Because those macrophages need, trust me, they need bioavailable copper to do their work. But in, a, uh, in the modern era, moms don't have enough minerals. I was just talking to a, a mom today. She was 43 when she had her son. And we started talking about her mother, her grandmother, and her great-grandmother. And there was absolute clear indications of mineral deficiency that went back three generations, or four, including the son. And, and and it wasn't just mineral deficiencies. It was clinical signs of copper deficiency. So that, you know, when you, when you get born with uh, scarlet fever, that's an absolute sign of, of uh, shortage of, of um, copper. Uh, when you get cataracts and you're 26 years old, you know there's something wrong with your copper iron balance in your eye. When you get cancer at a very young age, you know there's a copper iron dynamic. And that's what this family was going through. And so now the son has Kaiser Fleischer rings in his eyes, which is a clear sign of copper iron dysregulation. And the eyes, for your listeners, are connected to the liver. So they're a window to the liver. So if the eye's not happy, then that means the liver's not happy. The ears are connected to the kidney. So if the ears aren't working right, that means the kidney's not working right. Um, and that's just classic traditional Chinese medicine. But the thing is, this particular person who's had their third child, I would bet she didn't have enough minerals for the first child, and she's had two more. And when there's this massive copper download that happens, uh, it's basically robbing her body. The, the next generation is going to get whatever the mom has. And if the mom doesn't have it, it's just going to start stealing it. And what happens when we get low in copper, we're going to start to get high in iron, and then we're going to become more reactive to our environment, especially our food environment and our outdoor environment, you know, grasses and pollens and all sorts of things. And what happens when we become sensitive to our environment, we start making more histamines. Well, histamines are very, they are the ultimate stress hormone in the body. And what do they do? They change the mineral dynamics and the uh, energy dynamics of the cell. We lose magnesium and potassium inside the cell. Then calcium and sodium and water come rushing in. And the energy of the cell goes from negative 65 millivolts to negative 30 millivolts. It's an enormous loss of energy. And that's where the magnesium loss enters in. And how, how does Mother Nature want us to neutralize those histamines? It's an enzyme called histaminase. And in a healthy human that has fully loaded ceruloplasmin, one of the 24 enzymes that ceruloplasmin will express is called histaminase. And there will be a 400% rise in histaminase when ceruloplasmin is functioning properly in the body. And so what what's causing the headaches is histamines. They're totally dysregulating minerals and water and very uncomfortable. And you can dig into the annals of headache, and that's really what it is. It's, a, it's histamine dysregulation. And 
this particular individual has given child, has born three children. She didn't have the, the mineral mass. She's out of balance. She's not broken, but she does have mineral imbalance, and it's aggravating her ability to get through the day. And she just she needs to uh, rethink what's going on and, and maybe spend some more time at the uh, root cause protocol. That was an awesome, awesome explanation. And you mentioned uh, bone marrow, and this is something I actually realized a few days ago. I don't know why it didn't click, but macrophages are in the bone marrow. And so oh, yeah. I know it's, it's a big paleo thing right now, like eat the bone marrow and mm -hmm. you know make a bone marrow bone broth. Mm -hmm. But that's a massive source of iron, right? That we want to yeah, the, limit. It's better to do the other bones. Well, it, the highest affinity for iron in the human body is bone marrow. It's It's like... Why? Because that's where the, see the, the bone marrow, it's got a really important job. It says, am I going to make bone cells? Or am I going to make red blood cells? It's got to decide. And depending upon what the physiology of the person, depending on the age, depending upon the accumulation of iron in their body. And yes, iron does accumulate in the bone and in the bone marrow, as you point out. Um, but it's, it's an incredible source of, of nutrients. Again, if it's, if it's a healthy animal being raised under proper conditions, bone marrow would be a great thing. But you know, you, you're not going to take a CAFO cow, cut, cut down its leg and start sucking on that. It's just that would be insane. But but, but there's but there's incredible nutrients in that bone marrow because it's a it's a major resource center for building the body. It's it's like it's a it's a and and it's don't you find it fascinating that fifty percent or forty six percent of the copper in the body is in the bone marrow? It's like, and the highest affinity for iron is in the bone marrow. It's like, so then maybe that copper is managing that iron. Maybe you think it's like you know, people don't think about that because they've never been exposed to the the mystery and the the, the magic and the the, the amazing uh, properties of minerals. I, I just think they're fascinating. That was awesome. So. Maybe a strategy, I think I freaked a few people out, like, oh, I'm going to throw away these bone marrow capsules, but you can take them with coffee to mitigate any iron, but you're saying there's copper in there too to help balance it. Again, everything's in context. We're not telling people to eat margarine. We're telling people to eat grass-fed butter that's coming from an area where people, where people know what cows like. They like to be outside. They're, what are their bodies? Their bodies are solar panels. You know, what do cows do? They lick each other. You know why they lick each other? Because they're licking the vitamin D. Didn't know that, did you? Wow. So again, so on the farm we have we have little solar panels. Those are called chickens. We have bigger solar panels. Those are called pigs. And then we have the really big solar panels. Those are called cows. And it's like they have amazing properties beyond their classic foods. They're just they're rich sources of nutrients across the board. Again, you got to you got to go. Um, Barbecue, nose to tail. You know, you got to do the got to do the whole animal if you're going to get all the benefits of it. I love it. Um, next question: tinnitus and fullness in left ear, as well as jaw popping, like TMJ type of stuff. And earlier you mentioned the ears are connected to the kidneys, so probably something going on there. Yeah, it, it's a it's a stress response. Um, I, my my tinnitus actually got worse when I came to Louisiana. I never really had tinnitus until I moved to Louisiana. So I know that it's it's stress related, it's oxidative stress related. I don't I don't have a whiz bang solution. I find that my tinnitus gets aggravated when I will do a fast, and I and my body is saying I'm hungry, and I'm saying deal with it. We're not going to go there. And um, there there are like fifty different theories about it. I don't I haven't found one that makes sense to me other than we know it's a stress reaction. And I think it is in the kidney, and it, it it isn't it isn't really a sound. It's it's obviously it's a vibration, um, but it's the when it the other time that that my tinnitus will flare up, just so people have a sense of it. And when I cheat and will go get some ice cream, and if it's made with high fructose corn syrup, oh my God, the tinnitus is horrible. And so, what is high fructose corn syrup? Right? It's blocking copper function in my body. And so I, I know there's something about copper. I know there's something about kidney. I know there's something about stress. Um, when someone has like uh, TMJ issues, 
Uh, we know that stress because when we're under stress, we're, uh, we're crunching our teeth and it really puts a lot of pressure on this critical joint and the muscles there. Um, and when I had frozen shoulder, uh, which is, that's really what got me into all this was getting a, a frozen shoulder healed by my now wife who was a chiropractor. But but she actually released the tension when she put her, she, you know, she covered up her finger with a, a glove and she went inside my mouth and went inside that TMJ joint and she put tremendous pressure on it to release the tension that was there. And that it was like pouring hot water over ice. Suddenly it was just, I could feel the joint relaxing. And then suddenly I could, I could move my shoulder again because the, the, the nervous structure here runs all the way down into the shoulder. Fascinating. So if you have uh, tension here, it's going to affect more than just the jaw. And so again, that tension is going to cause magnesium loss. And then that magnesium loss is going to affect the physiology of the tissue. It's not going to make energy the same way. And then once the energy, when the tissue can't make energy right, then the, the tissue is even under more stress. So it's going to lose more magnesium. You, you see the spiral? And if you, don't, if you don't know that that's happening, then it really begins to wear you down. And it's, it's, it's literally fatiguing. Wow. Yeah, I have body worker friends that are into some really advanced body work, like resistant stretching, called genius of flexibility, just really cool techniques. And I think when you combine body work with magnesium, you're really making headway. But using one or the other alone isn't as effective. No, I think that's very true. Yeah. And the thing is, the, the body uh, will take advantage, the muscles will take advantage of that magnesium. They will, I mean, you're talking about storing magnesium. That's a great place to store it is in the, it's in the muscles. Awesome. Heavy periods, I guess they got measured low ferritin and low calcium. Okay. So um, it's important to understand that <clears throat> there's a lot of calcium in our body, but it's regulated by magnesium. All of the, the hormones, they're called calcitropic hormones. They regulate calcium level. All the calcitropic hormones, parathyroid hormone, calcitonin, and hormone D, are all regulated by magnesium status. That's very important to know. So that when calcium looks low on a blood test, we know that magnesium is really low, okay? That's very, very important. And the, the issue with ferritin, or, yeah, ferritin, ferritin's low. Do we have a number on that? It was just low, yeah. just low, okay. So, <clears throat> so low ferritin, it's really a false flag. We don't really know what it's telling us because those are empty shotgun shells. That's a scary moment when you realize, wait a minute, it's what? And so the iron has already been discharged. And when it's low, my reading of the, of the tea leaves and the research, I shouldn't call it tea leaves, people think I'm a quack, but my reading of the, re of the research, uh, this is the research of, of Dr. Welsh in 2009, uh, discovered that when there is copper deficiency, you lose ferrooxidase enzyme function, and then iron cannot be loaded into ferritin. And the body needs to do something with that iron, so it loads it into hemosiderin. You were talking about lipofusin. Well, lipofusin and hemosiderin are hanging out together. And so the iron is being stored in the hemosiderin, but it's not being measured in the blood test. Doctors only measure ferritin. On a very rare occasion, will they measure hemoglobin? And a very rare physician who will do ferritin, hemoglobin, and serum iron. And they don't measure hemosiderin because they weren't trained to measure hemosiderin. So we have no knowledge about how much hemosiderin there is. There is a, a way to measure it, but it's not done. And so we are using a false flag indicator of iron status that makes it seem like I'm low in iron, when in fact someone who's having a heavy period uh, is very likely estrogen dominant and is iron toxic. So let's tie it all together. So when there's estrogen dominance, why is the estrogen high? Because this person is iron toxic. The only way to get rid of excess iron is through blood loss. And in a body that has high iron and low bioavailable copper, there's no 
way to neutralize the toxicity of iron. And so there's no antioxidant enzyme doing its job, either ferrooxidase or you know, glutathione, peroxidase or catalase, all these major antioxidant enzymes. So the body goes to plan B. Well, the plan B antioxidant is called estrogen. And so estrogen is rising in an iron toxic body. And if estrogen's high, guess where progesterone's gonna be? It's gonna be on the floor in the basement, right? And so what are the what are the nutrients needed to make progesterone? Magnesium and B6. Oh, so if someone's under stress, they're losing magnesium and B6. Progesterone's going to be low. Estrogen's going to be high. We know the iron is high. Why is the, why is the magnesium high? Because the iron is high. Oh, so why is the magnesium low? Because the iron is high. It's going to burn up the... It, it burns up the, the, the nutrients for progesterone or magnesium and B6 specifically. Well, iron, excess iron is going to burn up both of them. And so we have this dysregulation of the menstrual cycle. And yes, the hormones are involved, but it's really a sea of minerals that are out of balance with each other. And that's not properly taught in um, the internet and certainly not in practitioner schools. Wow, that was amazing. Yeah, and I know the polyunsaturated fatty acids, when they oxidize, that raises estrogen through the roof too. Absolutely, again, the, the body has to respond to the oxidative stress. And and again, I think from some of the articles that I sent you was to, to demonstrate that um, fatty acid oxidation is bad. Let's, we're not going to debate that, but it's especially bad in a body that doesn't have ferrooxidase enzyme function, because that's that's what neutralizes the enzymes that cause that lipid peroxidation. So that's that's important for people to know that. Again, it's it's good to know half the story, but it's really good to know the whole story and what we've. What the internet, I believe, is littered with is half stories. And we're, we're, we get into mononutrients and, oh, let's talk about magnesium or let's talk about, you know, let, let's talk about B6 or let's talk about estrogen. It's like, wait a minute, let's, let's create the context that we started this conversation with. I love it. That's really good. And the last 10 minutes, I really want to get into solutions here. Um, so that some people have something to, to work. I mean, I'm, I'm, this is amazing, but I'm sure people are like, well, what do I do? You know? <laughs> so no, it's, it's, I understand that. And that for years, I, I didn't have a, a, what do I do? Now we do have a, what do I do? And, and that's what the root cause protocol is about. And the website, rcp123.org, uh, that they can, folks can download the instruction manual and begin to study that. The answers, all the answers are there. Give away the answer. And the, the part that's difficult is that people need to come to realize that there's a simple solution to all their problems. And that's very unsettling for people with high IQ because, first of all, we don't, we're not really good at letting go. So we don't let go of our ideas very easily. But the other thing is we love complexity. Oh, my God, we love, let's, you know, let me make it as complicated as I can. And that's what the system feeds on is our, our desire for a lot of complexity. And that's what the internet thrives on is let me make it as complicated as I can for you. And what has emerged in, in my research is that there, there is a uh, change that takes place in the liver. The liver becomes this Ferris wheel. The symptoms are sitting in the seats of the Ferris wheel. Practitioners treat the seats and they ignore the axle. And, the, and what's the focus of the root cause protocol is to fix the axle. And that's the copper iron dysregulation and the need for more minerals, especially magnesium. And so what do people do? Well, they've, I, I would encourage people to study that, you know, read, read the articles that you can find there, you know, follow other videos that we've done or others that I've done uh, online to get a better sense of what's going on. There's an, a video that people can look up. It's called My Theory of Everything, where in 52 minutes or something like that, I kind of give people the whole nine yards of what we're talking about. Uh, but there are, my God, there are like 75 or 80 different videos out there, almost too many. But they can, they can, they can access the uh, RCP 101 video series to educate them about what's really going on. And then they can just start the, the, uh, the process, and there's a series of things to stop doing, and, and it's going to fly in the face of convention because people are 
are so convinced that they need vitamin D and calcium and zinc and iron and I need I need my multi and and we stop all that because those forms of the those supplemental forms of those nutrients are not really designed for the human body and what we're really trying to do is get people to start bringing their body back into balance wherever possible with food based nutrients it's not 100% it's not it's not 100% natural for the purists out there but it's pretty close and and it's helping change lives. I, I just got a call from a dad. Uh, I've talked to him before, but we didn't we didn't complete the the conversation. But he was on a cruise, like a a week long cruise, and he got to talking about his son. And the woman that he was talking to said, well, "Have you looked into the root cause protocol?" He said, "Well, I I've talked to Morley." She said, "Well, that thing changed my life." She said, "It actually saved my life." It's like I always. I always bristle when I hear that because it's not me. It's it's Mother Nature that's doing it. We're just dusting off the, the physiology of the human body with the right nutrients. And people that are riddled with symptoms just need to know that there's a common point of origin. When when magnesium is low, when bioavailable copper is low, when iron is stuck in the tissue and doesn't show in the blood, that's important. It's a seesaw function doesn't show in the blood, but it's in the tissue. Well, then you get a lot of oxidative stress. And what does the oxidative stress do? It disrupts enzymes and the enzymes stop working. All you need to do is start to bring in the nutrients to make energy and get the the mojo going again. And then you can stand back and start to get your life back. And and the way I advise clients is do it low and slow. We're not, this is not a horse race. We're not sea biscuit. We're not trying to win the race. This is the tortoise and the hare. And you want to be the tortoise because the longer it takes, the longer it lasts. Very counterintuitive. Everybody wants to get well yesterday, right? And and no, you don't want to do that because it, do, it doesn't stick. So the whole mindset of conventional medicine is, well, let me give you this pill and you're going to feel better in about an hour. That's not real. That's not nature. Nature doesn't work like that. And so uh, there are some very compelling testimonials on that website. People can read up about people with a wide variety of conditions and say, wow. And that's why it is a root cause because, you know, and actually what we're even thinking about doing is saying we have a root cause for heart disease, a root cause for kidney disease, a root cause for eye disease. It's all the same thing. But people think, well, I've got an eye disorder, so I want the root cause for that. But, But it's all the same. And and there is this one size fits all. It, it it drives some people crazy, but but just like snowflakes all melt at thirty three degrees, and we all think of ourselves as a snowflake, the snowflake syndrome. Well, all all human snowflakes melt in the presence of iron, and it causes oxidative stress. And so we've got to we've got to correct that foundational imbalance between these minerals to get back. The, the symmetry and the physiology that allows us to have a, a normal life. So that, I love that's it. where I would start yeah. for, for folks. That, that's where, that's the really the, the key starting point. Perfect. And we're more, you're working with minerals, but it's more the minerals are allowing enzymes to work, exactly. right? Which will help to re, right. rebalance the body. Absolutely. And I, I've heard before, like minerals, it, it's vice versa as well, that minerals need enzymes to work. Or is it Say that again? more one way? Say that again. I, I've heard an enzyme expert, I think it was William or Dr. Wong or something, the systemic enzyme guy saying that enzymes allow minerals to work, whereas we think vice versa, that minerals allow. I think that's to- actually very clever that he worded it that way. I mean, it's easier for our our Western mind to think of the mineral being the key to start up the engine. The What the enzyme does is it allows the fullest expression of the mineral. And what are minerals doing? They're moving electrons. Now, for the for the folks on here that are worried about their genes, let me read an interesting uh, clip from, this is something that one of my uh, students shared with me that she found on Ben Lynch's website about what's going on. And I, I think this is important for people to know. I, I think Ben Lynch is a genius. The guy's incredible. But this is what he has to say about gene mutations in minerals. Gene mutations are simply transcription errors that have turned on 
due to mineral deficiencies. Minerals make enzymes, and genes are turned on and off by enzymes or lack of enzymes. Therefore, mineral deficiencies activate gene expression. That's a pretty powerful connecting of the dots. And, and again, there are clearly uh, deviations that are pretty significant, you know, like Down syndrome, or, you know, there are some major um, conditions that are affected by gene expression or gene structure, if you will. But, but then we have to ask ourselves, what was the epigenetics of the mother and of the child to allow that to take place? And, and what, what was the epigenetics of the mother who created the father who then helped create the child? So we have to, we have to step back and realize that the epigenetics, this, again, we're, we're back into Pasteur and Bechamp, particle field. Well, the particle is the gene. The field is the energy of too much iron in the body. And it does affect not just the electromagnetic field, it, it affects the energetic field of the body, and that then affects the structure and the function and the movement and the, the incredible work that these genes do to make proteins to allow enzymes to be activated. Wow, that's incredible. <laughs> it's just a different way of thinking uh, about it. Again, yeah. it, it, but, it, but it's based, when, when, what I've heard from a lot of people is I can feel them calming down. Their magnesium burn rate drops. And they say, you know, that, that, that's the first time it's made sense to me. And again, it's just, it's, it's just me interpreting thousands of, of research articles, connecting different dots from different authors from all parts of the world. But the, but the focus has all been around how do we lower stress in the human body? And let's focus on just a finite number of minerals. And, that, and the ones I've focused on are the ones we're talking about, magnesium, copper, and iron. And, and I think it's, there is a hierarchy. It, it's not, you know, we have 9,000 enzymes. Well, they're not 9,000 minerals out there. There's, there's a, there is a hierarchy. There's, what are there, 92 or 94 minerals on the planet? And there's 18 that are called essential. Well, I think there are only three that really matter in terms of really grabbing the physiology of the human body and bringing it into some semblance of a function. I love it. And I think I was listening to an interview by you the other day and you were saying iron is how much of the earth's crust? It's like 30 something percent or 36% <laughs> of the earth's composition is the element iron. And so if people are anemic, what that means is the most evolved species on the planet can't metabolize the metal that's of the highest concentration on the planet. That doesn't make any sense at all. And then when you find out that copper runs iron, then it starts to make more sense that, well, whoever talks about copper other than your copper toxic and you need to get rid of it. And then we begin to understand, well, oh, that's why I'm, I'm not doing so well. Yeah, I love it. Well, yeah, I hope this inspired some, some thoughts because I, I don't see many people talking about things the way that you do. And I think there's way too much focus on cleansing and mm -hmm. herbs and yep. just things that are way down the line instead of doing the foundational work, which is what you share. So yeah, no, I think it's a great, see what I think the, the root cause protocol does is it's a great place to start. And if, and if you haven't gained the level of function that you want, then you can begin to pursue some other things, but give the body a chance to regain its equilibrium using what mother nature regards as the fundamental uh, building parts. So I just, to me, it, it makes more sense intuitively. And I just think there's, too much uh, me too thinking out there. And I don't think there's enough breakthrough thinking about, well, what if we started to, to change the paradigm and, and really begin to think about the body as an energy being? Well, then how do we change the energy of the body? Well, you can't do that without making, you got to make energy, right? You got to have enzymes to, to change oxygen into water. And then suddenly we've got a very different view of the of the human body. I love it. Well, um, I'm going to close out the show. Thanks again for coming on. Just uh, stay with me. We'll you bet. Close Absolutely. It out. Thanks for the opportunity. Every time I talk with Morley, I get another piece of the puzzle that connects with something that I've heard or researched or read. 
many years ago. And it's just so many truth bombs that were dropped there. Really mind-blowing stuff. It's a 180 from how we think about disease to think about these chronic conditions from a mineral standpoint. And how many people are actually talking about magnesium, copper, and iron, and the role that they play in regulating all of the processes of the body. Super important stuff. I thought it was really interesting how iron accumulates in the eye. And from my research, when you have oxidized polyunsaturated fats, plus an excess of serotonin, which is a stress hormone, now you have iron, lipofuscin in the eye, that's a big problem. So this iron doesn't just accumulate in the heart, the liver, accumulates everywhere, the brain, and it really starves the cells of energy because they can't utilize oxygen. So that is the start of every disease, really. So if you want to dive deeper into Morley's work, go to therootcauseprotocol.com. And there's a lot of great information there. A lot of great articles as well. And if you want to support my work, you can go to matt-blackburn.com and see all my recommended products. You can also head over to mitolife.co and check out my brand. I just launched three new products. They're enzyme-based and they're very powerful, especially for someone with iron overload, which is pretty much everyone. I'll put all the links below so you guys can check out all of that good stuff. And if you like the show, please share it with your friends and family. Subscribe, leave me a good review if it helped you out. Really put a lot of time and energy into these interviews. And I'm really passionate about sharing this information that really isn't being talked about. Today's quote is by Morley Robbins from one of his Magnesium articles. For those keeping score across the board, Maggie stops so-called heart disease in its tracks. How? By ensuring that energy keeps flowing to the heart muscle cells, especially during times of stress. And when magnesium's not around to ensure that, a lot of very bad things happen in the heart and all around our body. It turns out that all forms of heart disease result from energy starvation. You see, the heart is the most energy demanding tissue in our body, bar none. It consumes more mag ATP per cell than any other part slash organ of the body. And it does so 24 seven. And when heart muscle cells can't get enough energy, they slow down and ultimately start to die. And when this happens often enough, entire parts of the heart muscle stop working, stop beating, stop allowing blood to flow, stop opening and closing properly, all from a lack of energy. By the way, this is not my theory. It was originally proposed by noted Harvard heart physiologist Joanne S. Ingwall, Ph.D. I didn't believe this starved heart theory at first either until I started delving deeper and deeper into this critical magnesium deficiency topic and its known effect on heart health. Little addendum here, you might be asking, what magnesium do I take? Well, avoid oxide and citrate because those don't do anything and or cause harm. The two on my website, I highly recommend. It's Electrolyte Balance, that's my top magnesium product. And that is front page on my website, matt-blackburn. It's the only liquid form magnesium. It's the most natural form that we used to get prior to the Industrial Revolution. You could also buy the Pristine Hydro Travel Water System. I think it's the most affordable and most effective filter that removes 100% of the acids and 100% of the contaminants, pharmaceuticals included. And you can make your own magnesium bicarbonate. That's the next step. And if you want to jump right into it and rebuild your magnesium reserves, that's what I would recommend. Investing in their travel system, which is very, very affordable compared to other filters that don't work as well and get the electrolyte balance powder and get a soda stream carbonator and start carbonating that water it has to be the pristine hydro water and then adding the electrolyte balance powder to it, shake it up and you are making your own magnesium supplement for a very, very affordable price. I don't know how much it costs a dollar or two a day or less 
That's one of the most affordable ways to do it. You just have to spend a little more up front. On my website, I also have MagTech, which is my favorite pill form of magnesium. I don't know why it is. Most people prefer pills. Maybe it's the shipping, the liquid, just too much work. The pill will never be as effective as the liquid form because the liquid bicarbonate form is ionic, which means that the bicarbonate actually drives like a car, the magnesium, deeper into the cell, into the mitochondria. And so these other forms, like in the pill form, it's not bad. They work, but they're synthetic. So threonate, glycinate, malate, these are all in the pill form that I have on my website, that product called MagTech. I take both of them. I take that with my coffee, and then I take the bicarbonate. And ideally, you want to go through one of those electrolyte balance. If you're just buying their liquid already made, go through one of those a week. And that would be a minimum. I would say try to even do more than that. And that's where you get into making it yourself because you don't have to ration how much you're consuming. So I hope that helps. That's my little rant on magnesium. I've been taking it for years and it has really made a difference in my health. Till next time, have a great day.